Hello and welcome to another edition of Spain Writes, America Reads, our virtual series of author talks to introduce recently translated books from Spain in the US. Today we have the pleasure of having Javier Cercas, one of, one of our best authors. I was uh, speaking with him before and remembering that one year ago, precisely one year ago, we were together in Cartagena de Indias in a different world. <laughs> But uh, we're very happy to have him here now. We're, we will uh, be more happy when we'll have him here in person, hopefully next year with his next book. But today we have him to introduce you this uh, uh, last book, book published in the States, which is Lord of All the Dead in El Monarca de las Sombras in Spanish. That's been translated uh, by Anne McLean and is published in the US by Vintage. And we have here to speak about the book, uh, the editor, uh, Diana Tejerina Miller, and the translator, uh, Anne McLean, who I understand has been the translator of all the books of uh, Javier, or almost all the books of Javier into, into English. So uh, Diane, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about this book. Um, I should say there may be in the audience um, another editor, Bill Swainson, um, who was actually the primary editor working on the text in English, um, but I have the great pleasure of being the American editor and looking after the American edition. Um, but I just wanted to briefly give you an overview of the book before we start, um, and I'm going to ask Javier to um, chime in and give some additional context. Um, but Lord of All the Dead, um, we're calling it a nonfiction novel. The book is occupied by Javier's search to find out more about his great uncle, who was this golden child of the family killed in one of the bloodiest battles of the Spanish Civil War, fighting for the fascists. And, and how did this young man end up so passionately on the wrong side of history? And how much also do we want to know about our own family's secrets? Um, and, and let me turn it over to Javier to give you more about this. Yes. Um, this is the book I wanted to write. I always wanted to write. And um, the title of the book, it's very important. It says a lot about the book itself. Uh, Lord of All the Dead. Uh, uh, th this is connected to Achilles' story. I mean, this young boy, Manuel, was called Manuel Mena, was the uncle of my mother, uh, almost his, her brother because they lived together, and was the official hero of my family. My whole family was a family of Frankists, people who were on the Franco, Franco side. And uh, this young boy went to the war when he was 17 years old, he was a kid, and he died when he was 19. And of course, for my mother, uh, who was a kid at that time, five years old when the war woke up, seven when, when this boy died, when Manuel Mena died, for her, he was the hero, the perfect hero. In fact, I think that the main character, I don't know what's your opinion, but for me, the secret protagonist of the book is my mother. Because my mother kept talking to me, my mother, my mother kept talking to me about this boy since I was a kid. And I thought that for her was a sort of a, an example, a sort of the perfect hero, a sort of Achilles. Everybody remember uh, the Achilles of the Iliad, who is exactly the perfect hero, the young, brave man that goes to the war, fighting for his ideals and fighting in the first rank, risking his life and dies in combat, and then lives forever in the memory of men, which, which is, the, of course, the, the heaven of, of the ancient Greeks. Okay, so during a long time, during my whole life, I was thinking that for my mother was a sort of Achilles and that he was putting me, Manuel Mena, this Achilles as an example of how to live, or what, what was to be perfect as a, as a human being, as a man. But writing this book, I sort of discovered that I was wrong, that uh, maybe, uh, well, she was not talking about the Achilles of the Iliad, but about the Achilles of the Odyssey. In the Odyssey, the main character 
of the book is not Achilles, but Ulysses, which is exactly the contrary as Achilles, right? Exactly the contrary. He's a man who lives a long life, goes back home, etc., uh, and dies old, etc. But there is a moment, an extraordinary moment, in which uh, appears Achilles, the main character in the Iliad. Just this moment. And it is when uh, Ulysses goes down to the realm of death, to, the, to Hades. This is the, the name in, in English, right? Hades. Okay. And yeah. the world, yes. <clears throat> when, when, when the dead people leave. And then Ulysses finds uh, Achilles and he tells him, oh, Achilles, you were the most admired of, admired of men, the, the perfect hero when you were alive. And now here you must be the Lord of all the dead, right? You must be the, the, the most admired of all the men, et cetera, et cetera. And then Achilles says something extraordinary. One of the mo most moving moments, in my opinion, of history of literature, when Achilles says, well, uh, and, and why don't you read the, the verses of Homer in English? <laughs> okay. <laughs> read them, please, read them, because they are incredibly moving. Okay. Um, uh, in, in this book, Achilles replies, illustrious Odysseus, don't try to console me for my death. For I would rather toil as the slave of a penniless, landless laborer than reign here as Lord of all the dead. That's it. So uh, it's the repentance of Achilles. Achilles finds, feels that he was mistaken, that it was a mistake to risk his life and to, to die. It would be better to be the humblest of men, the penniless, I don't know what he says. And that's, that's really the core of the book. I mean, I think that the central question of the book is, is it worthwhile to risk your life and eventually to, to, to die for the values in which you believe, even though these values are wrong? Because that's the whole point. <laughs> or even Manuel if Mena was wrong. Manuel Mena was on the wrong side of history. And he, I, I think that at the end of his life, he knew it. And that's what is really moving. And that's, that's the central question of the book is, is it, what, what is better to be Ulysses and to li live a long life or to be Achilles and to die young? I insist, even though the values in which you believe, the values by which you die are wrong. And Javier, um, yeah, maybe, um, maybe on that, the, could, you, um, could you read for us a little bit from the beginning of the book? Sure. Thank you. In the Spanish. Yes, please. <clears throat> Se llamaba Manuel Mena y murió a los 19 años en la Batalla del Ebro. Fue el 21 de septiembre de 1938, hacia el final de la Guerra Civil, en un pueblo catalán llamado Bot. Era un franquista entusiasta, o por lo menos un entusiasta falangista, o por lo menos lo fue al principio de la guerra. En esa época se alistó en la tercera bandera de falange de Cáceres y al año siguiente, recién obtenido el grado de alférez provisional, lo destinaron al primer tabor de tiradores de IFNI, una unidad de choque perteneciente al cuerpo de regulares. Doce meses más tarde murió en combate y durante años fue el héroe oficial de mi familia. Era tío paterno de mi madre, que desde niño me ha contado innumerables veces su historia, o más bien su historia y su leyenda, de tal manera que antes de ser escritor yo pensaba que alguna vez tendría que escribir un libro sobre él. Lo descarté precisamente en cuanto me hice escritor. La razón es que sentía que Manuel Mena era la cifra exacta de la herencia más onerosa de mi familia y que contar su historia no solo equivalía a hacerme cargo de su pasado político, sino también del pasado político de toda mi familia, que era el pasado que más me abochornaba. No quería hacerme cargo de eso, no veía ninguna necesidad de hacerlo y mucho menos de airearlo en un libro. Bastante tenía con aprender a vivir con ello. Por lo demás, ni siquiera hubiese sabido cómo ponerme a contar esa historia. Hubiera debido atenerme a la realidad estricta, a la verdad de los hechos, suponiendo que tal cosa fuese posible y el paso del tiempo 
no hubiese abierto en la historia de Manuel Mena vacíos imposibles de colmar? ¿Hubiera debido mezclar la realidad y la ficción para rellenar con esta los huecos dejados por aquella? ¿O hubiera debido inventar una ficción a partir de la realidad, aunque todo el mundo creyese que era veraz, o para que todo el mundo lo creyese? No tenía ni idea, y esta ignorancia de forma me parecía la ratificación de mi acierto de fondo. No debía escribir la historia de Manuel Mena. Thank you. And Anne, will you um, give us the English version, please? Okay. It's the exact same bit <laughs> in English. His name was Manuel Mena, and he died at the age of 19 in the Battle of the Ebro. It was September 21st, 1938, towards the end of the Spanish Civil War in a Catalan village called Bot. He was an enthusiastic supporter of Franco, or at least an enthusiastic phalanchist or at least he was at the beginning of the war. That was when he enlisted in the third bandera of the Cáceres Falange, and the following year, having recently attained the rank of provisional second lieutenant, he was posted to the first tabor of Ifni Riflemen, a shock unit belonging to the Corps of Regulars. 12 months later, he died in combat, and for years, he was the official hero of my family. He was my mother's uncle on her father's side, and she has told me his story countless times since I was a boy, or rather his story and his legend, so often that even before I was a writer, I thought I would have to write a book about him one day. I discarded the idea as soon as I became a writer. The reason is that I felt that Manuel Mena was the exact paradigm of my family's most onerous legacy, and telling his story would not only mean taking on his political past, but also the political past of my whole family, which was the past that most embarrassed me. I did not want to take that on. I did not see any need to, and much less to discuss it at length in a book. It was enough to have to learn to live with it. Besides, I wouldn't have even known how to start telling that story. Should I have stuck strictly to reality, to the truth of events, supposing that such a thing were possible and that the passing of time had not opened impossible to fill gaps in Manuel Mena's story? Should I have mixed reality and fiction to plug up the holes inevitably left by the former? Or should I have invented a fiction out of reality, even though everyone might believe it was true, or in order for everyone to believe it was true? I had no idea, and my ignorance of the form seemed to be an endorsement of my decision on the content. I should not write the story of Manuel Mena. Thank you, Anne. And then, aren't we glad you did, Javier, <laughs> the story of Manuel Mena. Um, and I want to ask you, um, you know, this idea of mixing reality and fiction and the fact that we're, we're calling the book a nonfiction novel. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that means and what the form of the book is? Um, yes, this is a nonfiction novel. This is not the first nonfiction novel that I write. And people maybe could ask, what, what means that? Is it possible a non-fiction novel? Because theoretically, all novels are fiction. But I, the guy who invented this, this thing called novel, which by the way was a Spanish, Spanish guy called Miguel de Cervantes, uh, said to us, to all novelists in the future, gave us just one rule. There is no rules for you. You can do whatever you want. So, that's, I took this very seriously. And sometimes I write novels without fiction. I mean, novels in which there is not such a thing of, there is no invention. Can be imagination, but no invention. And this is one of them. And why is this a novel? It's very, it's very easy to answer this question at the same time, very very, it's very complex to, to answer to that. It's a form that makes a, a novel. I mean, a novelist, is somebody that thinks that through form, you can arrive to a truth to which it is impossible to arrive through another way, right? And, and this novel is, is as, all, as, as some of my previous novels since Soldiers of Salamis 20 years ago has some characteristics in common. For instance, the mixture of genres. It is part history, it is part uh, reportage, 
it is part biography, it is partly autobiography. This is, I think that novels can do that, can, can, can mix lots of genres. Cervantes again invented the novel like this, according to me. And there's another, <laughs> just another uh, thing that I would like to uh, uh, point out, which is the fact that in, there, is, there is a dialogue between past and present, between the story of Manuel Mena, which is a story of the recent past of the 30s, you know, the civil war, etc., the 20s and the 30s, and my own story, the present story. This is not a book about the, the past. It is a book about the present, as all my books. And, and, and why is that? Well, because there is a story, I tell a story, the story of Manuel Mena and of my family, one of my little village, thinking always about what Tolstoy, Tolstoy said once, paint your little village and you will paint the world. I love that. I mean, through a tiny village, a tiny story you can tell something that is bigger, that is, that is for everybody, right? And so I tell a story, but I, always, I also tell something very, very important, which is the, the process of telling this story. So how I, my doubts, my perplexities, how I, I didn't want to write the story, how I, so all this process, right? How I go to places to find a witness, the last witness of the life of Manuel Mena, etc. right? So I try to show, I always say, Diana, I, I write uh, adventures, novels, about the adventure of writing novels. So the adventure of writing the novel, it is as important as the story itself, the novel itself. Yes, and the reader is on that journey with you. And I think that's yes. one of the things that's most exciting about the book is, you know, the drama and the surprise of the reader experiencing the discoveries and the highs and lows and the joys and disappointments with you. Um, that's very and, important. That's very yeah. important, extremely important. Uh, and, uh, I want the reader to be with me. I want, I want the reader to share, this is not, a story, a, a, you know, extraordinary story that is out there. It's something that is happening to me and to him. I want to involve him in this in this adventure, which is a moral and political adventure too. Mm -hmm. And would you say was is this the book of all your work? Is this the most personal book you've written? In a sense, yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, because it's a book, first of all, as I said, as I wrote in this paragraph, it's a book I, I always wanted to write. Since the beginning of my life, I insist my mother, we all have these kind of stories. We all have them. These kind of stories that our parents tell us, keep telling us because it's important for, for us. It's our heritage. That's, that's, I would say that this is, that's why this is my most personal book because this book deals with my personal heritage also with my collective heritage and i would say more with the my worst heritage because this is very important what i'm going to say for me it, for this book is essential uh and for, and for my previous books also uh we'll have a good personally and collectively a good heritage and a bad heritage we all have that. And it is quite more or less easy to cope with the good heritage, but what we do with our bad heritage. And we all have them, we all have this bad heritage. My worst heritage as uh, individually and collectively is called the civil war. Spanish had a civil war during three years. Well, not three years, 43 years. The books, history books says, say, that Spanish Civil War, it's three years, from 36 to 39. This is atrocious. This is something awful. The worst war is a civil war because it's a, a, a war between brothers, right? But in fact, the Spanish Civil War lasted 43 years because the dictatorship, Franco's dictatorship was not peace, was war by other means. So, and this is our worst heritage collectively. But individually, my work heritage is also this one. And be because my family was involved in this war and because my family was on the wrong side of history. 
I didn't know at the beginning uh, how was that exactly, but I knew that. And, and to cope with this heritage is absolutely essential for me, and sorry to say that, but for everybody, for everybody, because if we understand, we know this heritage in all its complexities and all its harness and all its atrocities and all its, et cetera, if we know it and we understand it, we can govern it. But if we don't know it and we don't know, if we don't understand it, it is this heritage, this past that governs us. And we keep repeating once and again, the same mistakes. Past is not dead, is not even past, says Faulkner in Requiem for a Nun. And is it, it is absolutely true. I mean, <laughs> the past of the civil war, the past, all this past, this awful past, this awful heritage is here, is, is, is a, this past, the past of which there is a memory and witnesses has not, has not passed, is a dimension of the present without which present is mutilated. And you must know that we've seen, I finish. This is not, sorry to say that, but when I was young, when I was a boy, when I was a kid, I thought that my country was different from the rest of the countries, that my country had special problems with its past, that we, we weren't able to digest this difficult past, civil war, dictatorship, etc. But now I know that all countries and all persons have these problems, all of us. Sorry to finish with that. We, we have seen in the most uh, powerful country of the world and in the most, and the, the most solid democracy in the world, we have seen in the last day, these guys entering into the, you know, the house of people, the capital, have, uh, with, with flags of the Confederacy. Past is there. And it's, a, it's, a, it's even more uh, far away, this past, but it's here in the, in the States. As, it, as, as the Frankish past, as the, the past of civil war is here, is in us. And that's why, because, why is that? Because we haven't digested this past, because we haven't, uh, we, we don't know it in all its complexity and we don't understand it in all its complexity and all its, and that's why it's so important. And that's why my books don't deal with the past. They deal with the present, with this present that entails the past, that has in it the past. Yes, well, and uh, you know, the book was published about a year ago in the US, but it does resonate, especially now. I mean, given what you're saying, I think if you asked most Americans, is the Civil War present in your everyday lives? Mm -hmm. They probably would have said no but the events of the last few weeks have, have shown that that's not true. <laughs> and your book shows that as well. I mean, do you feel that it has special residence now in this particular moment? My answer is of course, yes. Because I, I insist, I don't write about the past. They give me prices, when they give me prices of historical novels, as if I wrote historical novels, I said, no, 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 I'm sorry, but I don't write, thank you for the prize, but I don't write <laughs> historical novels. I write novels about the present. And more, half of this book is about the present. And I try, what I try in this book is to show how this past that seemed buried and forgotten and lost and digested, it is not digested. It is part of the present. Look, for instance, Manuel Mena, was a man, a young man, young boy, fascinated by fascism. And if you read some of the, of the texts that fascinated him, uh, they are texts that could have been written today. No doubt. Why is that? It's very easy. Uh, uh, what, what we call now uh, national populism, and the, mm -hmm. the biggest symbol of this national populism, of course, was Donald Trump, but this national populism is everywhere, you know, in Italy, in France, in England, everywhere. This is, for me, a mask of fascism. I mean, history doesn't repeat itself exactly. It repeats itself with different masks. And it is obvious, this, it is absolutely obvious that 
we, in the last years, Donald Trump is the biggest uh, symbol of that because it's, we're talking about the most important country in the world. Uh, but we have been, since the big crisis of 2008, we have been repeating the same mistakes with different masks that we repeated after the 29th crisis. The, the 1929 crisis provoked, created, or consolidated fascism around the world with different masks, with, with different variations. The 2008 crisis has spread all over the world this national populism. And the, the, what, the things that define this national populism are very similar with different masks of that of fascism, the return of nationalism, which is one of the most obvious traits of, of this. Look, Manuel Mena was fascinated by this movement because this movement was fashion. This movement was apparently revolutionary, right? Uh, theoretically anti-capitalism, yeah. uh, you know, anti-system. That was fascism. We have completely forgotten what is fascism. It was re revolutionary. They presented themselves like that. Well, like Donald Trump in a sense, he was anti-elitist. He was, I'm talking about Donald Trump because, because <laughs> we're talking for American yeah, audience. Not, but I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I could talk about, about the Brexit, about what's happening in France, in Italy, everywhere, of course, in Spain. And, 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 uh, that's, that's for me very important. I mean, Manuel Mena was poisoned by the same venoms that are still in the air, but in a very obvious way. So well, one of the things I, I think is so important about the book is that you seek to understand him that you don't want to sit in judgment of him, even though you believe and I believe, and I'm sure most people who read believe that his views were wrong. Um, it's not about the fact that they were wrong so much as how, how did he come to it? And how was he seduced by this set of values, even though we find them repellent? I think the book makes clear how seductive it was to a young man at that time. And that can be a sort of shocking experience as a reader, you're a liberal, you feel like you don't have a, a Frankist bone in your body and yet you read some of the texts that he was reading and you see what he was going through and you understand why he came to the decision that he did. This is very important. I think it's our, what we should do as writers is to understand and to understand even the most terrible things. And that's what great literature according to me does. And that's why great literature is useful. I mean, let me put you whatever example. I mean, we can, I don't know. Uh, to put an, ex an, a, an example, an American example again, we all understand, we all, uh, we all uh, love Michael Corleone, right? <laughs> My, the, the main character in, in, in The Godfather. And we cry with him when at the end of this wonderful film, they kill uh, his daughter. Uh, but this guy is a monster. This guy killed, even killed, he has killed lots of people, but he has killed his own brother. And we are with him, we cry with him. We, that's what great art does. I mean, think of uh, Richard III, probably the biggest monster in history. I mean, Shakespeare's character. But there, is, there are moments in this incredible play in which you feel with him. You think that this guy who is a real, 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 real monster, even worse than Michael Corleone, you are with him. <laughs> and that's what literature makes us do. I mean, to understand evil. Why? Because if you understand evil, you can combat it. If you don't understand it, it is impossible to go against it. And that's why literature is so useful. I, and of course, I wanted to understand why a young boy, intelligent, he was an intellect, he wanted to be an intellectual. <clears throat> uh, he, he was good in, 
uh, well-intentioned, no doubt. He, who was trying to be a hero, a real hero. He was trying, he was going to the war to support, to defend his, his family and, and the religion and values that were really important, the, the homeland. And how he was completely fascinated by this, by this uh, poisoned uh, ideology. And I wanted to understand that. I think that this is, uh, literature is not about judging. Judges, judging is about judges. We, we writers don't, don't judge, and only the worst writers judge. The, the good writers, according to me, what they try is to understand. Even the most terrible things and the most terrible um, people, that's what's difficult, that was, was really difficult. And that's why sometimes literature is dangerous also. And that's why the writer must be courageous. A writer that is not, has not the courage to go till the end and to understand the most uh, complex, difficult, terrible, uh, he's not doing very well his job. That's why I think that courage is a, um, I mean, I, I'm, as a person, I'm not particularly courage, courageous, but as a writer, a writer that, that is not courageous is not a writer. It's something different. <laughs> it's, 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 he 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 chose the wrong, the wrong. <laughs> it's like wrong a question. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and I want to also invite Anne into the mix because um, the role of translator is also a courageous one. And <laughs> we're, we're talking about how, on the one hand, the book is so personal, and on the other hand, it encompasses so many different universalities and I wanted to ask you Anne did that did that present any challenges as you were working to both make it very particular and to make it resonate universally hmm. um well um I don't know if uh if I if it's my job to make it resonate universally um I as as uh, Miguel said at the beginning, I've been translating Javier for 20 years now. So um, I've learned mainly that uh, sticking as closely as possible to his words, obviously I have to change every one because I have to turn them into English words, but um, he he knows what he's doing um, with his with <laughs> with his sentences and his yeah. <laughs> We at the very beginning, like back in two thousand and one, we used to we used to argue about his semicolons because there were a lot of semicolons for for English prose. But he loves semicolons. He loves punctuation, and and he, uh, I mean, I just have to trust him, and he does know what he's doing. <laughs> but um, I I mean, what we were talking about before about uh, how the politics of it is so shocking for us as <laughs> liberal readers. When I, when I first read Soldiers of Salamis, I was totally blown away. But the, the second part of it, which is all about explaining fascism and the, the ideologue, this Sanchez Mathas guy, I was just like flabbergasted. I had no idea that, that you know, decent young men fell for these words, for poetry, for, um, like that's how they got sucked into fascism. So I learned this from Javier 20 years ago and we've carried on. But can I ask him a question, which is- Please, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need my permission. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> in, in the most recent novel of his, which I've just read, which hasn't actually been published yet, there's a, there's a character who's um, talking to one of the other characters about this writer guy called Javier Cercas. And he says, he, when he says that everything in his novels is true, he probably <laughs> makes it all up. So when these novels that he says are actually completely fiction, these are all true because they're about this character. <laughs> <laughs> so Javi. <laughs> yeah, it is a joke, of course. <laughs> I know. There is, no, there is no literature, according to me, <laughs> without irony. There is no, uh, that's sometimes it's also shocking for 
the new readers of some of my books, for instance, this one, where yeah. we are dealing with very serious subjects, moral subjects, political subjects, historical subjects, but at the same time, there is humor. I mean, in this case, for instance, all the whole part of the process of writing the novel, the whole part of the present, it's full of jokes and it's full of, of, of humor. And for yeah. some people, this is, this is uh, but my, my answer to that is there is nothing more serious than humor. And again, this guy called Miguel de Cervantes showed that to us. I mean, there is no contradiction be between seriousness and humor. And yes, in this last book, which is not even published in Spain, in Spain, you've read, there is people, uh, this is in fact the second part of a new novel, a novel called Terralta, High Gland, something like that. And <laughs> the characters in the book have read the first part of the, the first novel, right? <laughs> Except so, for the character who's in it. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I make jokes about myself because humor begins with oneself. I mean, if you are not able to laugh about yourself, you have no right to laugh about, that's again Cervantes, I mean. Yeah. This, this, great, this guy invented everything. So, so does your mom think this book's funny? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, that's another thing. <laughs> family with this book is very complex. I mean, I deal with yeah. family and this is very, when you deal with real characters, in your books, you are, I mean, it's possible that you will have problems. It's yeah. always possible. That you, you have to be have. very brave. <laughs> and, and especially if these people are part of your family. Of course, yeah. this is, gets very difficult. Mostly there has been in my family, not my mother, but my family has been silence. Really? Yes. Yes, silence. They were not comfortable. About but not your mother. She's your biggest fan. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, my mother. For my mother, was all, everything was great. But, uh, <laughs> but for, for the rest of the family, it was difficult. Because it's always difficult. I insist. This is not, I mean, my case is not special. I'm a very normal person. Uh, I'm almost like Dali. Dali said, I'm super normal. <laughs> so I'm almost like him. Um, almost. And, 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 and all, we all have that, these kind of things, these kind of stories. I'm sure you have these kind of stories. An uncle or some, somebody that embodies something very important for the family. And when you touch this point, uh, you are touching the essential point of your legacy. And you, when you touch this point, you, are, you, you will have problems with the family yeah. because like when you paint somebody in a book, People don't recognize themselves in, because we all think that we are beautiful and intelligent. And, and <laughs> well, it seems also that one of the real motivations for writing the book was because there had been silence in your family for decades, um, that the, there was that portrait of him that's on the cover of our edition and that you talk about in the book. Um, but otherwise he had sort of disappeared and to try and address that silence was one of the reasons he wrote the book. So your family is just being very consistent. <laughs> they stayed silent <laughs> again. <laughs> yes, and that's, Diana, that's a paradox because of course, people, when people talk about silence, uh, they talk about the people that were defeated in the war. I mean, during 40 years, during the dictatorship in Spain was not possible to talk about the Republicans, the people that were defeated because they were defeated, right? So there was silence, but this is a very simplistic view of things because even in the, in the side of, of, of the people who win the war, there was silence. Mm -hmm. I mean, my family didn't want to talk about this boy. My family burned. There is a, there is a, there is a, scene which was for me was very important when my mother was this is a everything is true in the book uh, when my mother went to to my mother was like 40 years old 14 years old so 70 seven years after the die, the death of this boy one day he arrives home and he sees her grandmother and other people uh, uh burning things 
in, in the house, right? Burning things. And she asked, what is that? What are you doing? And they tell her, they told her, we are burning everything of Manuel Mena. Be and, and, and she asked, why, why, why you do that? I mean, are you crazy? What? And somebody, an uncle tells her, because we don't want to suffer more. So silence, they, want, they, they thought that to, to bury everything was the form of not suffering more. Even, I insist, so this boy, I mean, people could imagine, okay, this boy was a hero in the family. So of course, everybody talk about him and people were proud of him. And no, 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 it's not like that. I mean, a war and that is something so, and the death of, of a boy of 19, 19 years old is so hard, so, so difficult to accept that this silence is also the result of this, right? And yes, I went, I went to break this silence because I believe what I said at the beginning, that it's compulsory. We need to know and we need to understand. Even the most, is the, the only way to heal. Yes. It's the only way. Because if not, the, this is there. This is always there. Past is always there, as Faulkner said. So we must go there and show that it's still here. And to try yeah. to heal it. That's what literature is so, so great literature is so useful. Well, and this might also be a good moment. Um, speaking of breaking silence, I see there are some members of the audience, I think, who had questions and who have been patiently waiting. Um, Miguel? Oh. Are there some questions? Yes, Diane, there are several questions. Some of them have already been answered because uh, Megan Harris is asking, how did your family react to the book? So Javier just talked about it. Uh, uh, Adam Chambers is asking, hi, Javier. I love what you mentioned about having us, having just one rule to write a novel. You can do whatever you want. And maybe that's why I enjoy your book so much. What advice would you give to an aspiring writer? The kind of advice you wish someone would have given you when you first started to write? Thank you. Well, I'm very good at uh, receiving advice, but very bad at giving advice, very bad. <laughs> but if I would, um, I I'll say this, uh, <clears throat> read a lot, write a lot, and don't be in a rush to publish. That's uh, my three advices. Read a lot, write a lot, and don't rush, don't, don't, don't be in a rush to, to publish. Great, this, is, this one is for Anne, it's uh, April Overstreet. How do you approach translating the underlying concepts or context that are well understood by native Spanish speakers and that go much deeper than the surface or word sentence, paragraph level? For example, there's some answer that a word such as falangista or franquista has for Spanish reader is not meaningful in the same way for most readers in England. A related question is, do you feel that there are certain cultural terms that cannot or should not be translated? Well, um, uh, good point. Phalanquista, I didn't, I mean, I translate it, I just put phalangist, which obviously doesn't mean the same thing to a North American or British reader as it does to a Spanish reader. And Franco and Francoist, they just stay as they are. And um, in a previous brilliant book by Javier called Anatomy of a Moment, um, we had a terrible time trying to translate the term golpista, which um, means someone who perpetrates a coup d'etat. <laughs> so those people who uh, stormed the capital a few weeks ago who reminded me of Tejero and his gang. And I'm sure they reminded Javier of the same thing. In fact, in The Guardian, there was a photograph which is exactly the cover of Anatomia de un Instante with, with <laughs> Tejero in the Congress. Um, but in English, we don't even have a word for coup d'etat. We use the French word coup d'etat. So you can't say a, a coup perpetrator. You, we, we um, we toyed around, I think Javier was in England uh, when, we, when I was working on this translation and we discussed it and we were thinking of calling it a putsch 
and then Puchich, <laughs> which neither of us could pronounce. <laughs> so we ended up just using gold pista, I think in italics in the book and explaining it, which you have to do. Um, well, you don't have to. I mean, other translators would come up with other solutions, but uh, I was I was discussing this at length. I think I was in Barcelona and Javier and Ignacio Martinez de Bison, who's another Spanish writer, and I were arguing about what we could do with this word. And he said, you're so lucky. You English people don't even have this underlying concept in your brain that golpista, golpe, makes you go, oh, and we don't even have a word for it. But, you know, we're not that lucky because look what happened in Washington a few weeks ago. Now you will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's the word, Diana? Tell us. <laughs> Uh, I think that we have one more question, time for one more question for each one. Uh, one is uh, Sankar, uh, I hope I pronounce this well, Sankar Chathuri. I get the impression that Manuel was not even an adult when he joined in the fighting. Is it fair to judge him from his decisions? For his decisions, sorry. Uh, well, no, it, I, 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 I try not to judge. That's what I try in the whole book. Of course, it, it, this is very important to say that. I mean, it's very easy 60 years after what happened to know who was on the good side on the wrong side of history. We know that. Uh, we, we cannot say we don't know that. We, we, I know, I am completely sure that Franco's coup d'etat was a mistake and that Manuel Mena was on the wrong side of history. I know that for sure. I cannot say I don't know it, but it, this doesn't mean that I judge Manuel Mena saying he did this because he, no, 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 not at all. Exactly the contrary, as I tried to explain. I try mm -hmm. to understand why a good person, I, I have all the reasons after all my life thinking about this boy to think all the reasons to think that he was honest, that he was brave, that he was an idealist, a real idealist, that he was, he thought that he was doing the best thing for his family, his country, his everything. But that the host, the, that's the whole point of the book, how the best people can do the worst things. That's something, and, and go for the worst causes. That's something very important. Mm -hmm. Usually we think, okay, good people only do good things. And we are good people, so we're going to do good things. But this is not the case. I mean, the best people can do the terrible things, given the circumstances. And that's what I try to do with Manuel Mena. I try to understand why he did what he did. But judging him is so easy, especially now, you know, living in a democracy peacefully, we are rich compared, compared to them. It's so easy. And so this is morally wrong to judge people that have been in difficult situations from our comfortable you know, uh, point of view. This is morally wrong and literally catastrophic. I try to avoid that uh, in every sentence I write. <laughs> Again, one last for Anne uh, from Gary Scombro. Does Ms. McLean talk with Mr. Tarkas about the meanings of his books and the emotions he wishes to convey before she starts translating them? Mm. I guess in other words, do you talk before you start translating the book of the whole idea of the book and the spirit of the book or the tone of the book or whatever? Not usually. Um, we talk during and, and after, and I mean, sometimes I see Javier when he's actually writing a book and he tells me things about, not much, but, <laughs> or, um, yeah, not really before. I ask him questions sometimes while I'm translating or once I have a, a draft or once Bill or Diana are editing. I might ask him questions, but um, not. We don't talk about it generally, do we, Javi? 
Do you remember? <laughs> My answer is I wouldn't say that this is, I'm not a translator, but I wouldn't say you that this been. is necessary. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that this is necessary and it can be misleading. Yeah. For one reason, just one reason, because trans translating, you know better than myself, of course, is a form of interpretation and mm. it's your interpretation. But also with your books, um, it can be very dangerous because not necessarily this one, but earlier ones, the, sometimes the narrator is called Javier Cercas, but it's not exactly you. Yeah. And when I translated Soldiers of Salamis 20 years ago, uh, we didn't actually meet till 2003, I think, or 2002, before the book came out in English, but after I'd finished the translation. But I, I did know that, I mean, there's a few clues at the beginning that it's not exactly you because yes. it's, he, he's not the same age as you and he's a little, he's, he's kind of goofy. <laughs> I don't, I don't know the word. He's goofier than you. No, no, no. It's, 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 a, it's called Javier Cercas, but it's different from me. Yeah, yes. yeah. Which is a, which is a good, um, I mean, had I known you before I read you, that could have been dangerous at the beginning i agree but now i know you and i translate you and it's okay <laughs> yeah I, I insist it's an interpretation in the musical sense of the word yeah you know? yeah uh you, you interpret beethoven and another person interprets beethoven in a different in a different way exactly it's a, a book is and you don't sound in english like you sound in english <laughs> all right your prose my prose of your prose yeah. is not the way yeah. you talk right <laughs> no, because you improve my prose. You improve <laughs> no, my prose. I don't improve your prose. I just make it into English prose. Well, we, I think we can close here. We have um, <laughs> more questions, but I, I think it's um, it's uh, the time to close. Uh, I, I thank you all for for being here. I I hope that Javier can come for the next next one from Terra Alta. I think it, it'll be great to have you here. Uh, this fall or, or next year, the latest, no? so that this uh, conversation we're having could be also in person. And uh, we invite you all to the next Spain Writes America Reads, which is next Tuesday. Uh, it's a book by Rabbit Island by uh, Elvira Navarro. And thank you all. Thank you, Ander and Clara in our cultural office for the work. And uh, happy to see you again. Bye all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.